And uh, today I will try to uh, sell you a box full of very useful tools. And uh, first of all, let me start uh, with saying that this is a joint work with several people, Carol Clark, Alec Kozlowski, Dirk Schleicher, and Sebastian van Steen. So, and um, I hope that the, by the end of this talk, you will be convinced that you have to rewatch uh, the previous talks in the mini course on renormalization and watch today uh, the talk by Davut, uh, who are working primarily on unicritical maps and neutral renormalization. And what I'm trying to, will try to convince you that so far this is the hardest case and the case that we have to understand. And if we do, then this toolbox that I will present for you today will help you to solve all the rest of your problems. This is kind of an ambitious goal, but let me try. So let me start with this picture. And of course, many of you know what exactly this picture tells you. So on the left, you can see a parameter space of some rational map. And this is, uh, in fact, cubic Newton maps. And you can see um, a small Mandelbrot set embedded uh, in the left part of this picture. And uh, on the right, you can uh, see the piece of the parameter space. And as many of you know, the mechanism why these Mandelbrot sets appear in the parameter space for Newton maps is that uh, there, is a, uh, there is a critical point uh, together with some disk that maps under the map to uh, some other disk. And then the, if you map it once again, it returns uh, over the critical point with some slightly larger disk. And if we uh, watch carefully, then we will see that um, all the uh, even iterates of these critical points will, will stay inside the smaller disk. And therefore, we can actually forget about everything else and restrict uh, our attention to uh, just this disk and consider the second iterate of the map. In this way, we obtain an induced dynamical system which essentially uh, captures the whole critical orbit that we were interested in. And of course, this picture, again, familiar to many of you, and this is a, a classical notion of uh, polynomial-like maps. Let me remind that a polynomial-like map is a branch cover between two topological disks of degree at least two, uh, such that one of the disks is compactly contained in the other. You can see a picture <coughs> on the right. And of course, this is a uh, partially defined map. And uh, for such maps, we're interested in a set uh, on which we can iterate this map infinitely often. And this is uh, what is called a field Julia set of this map. Uh, and you can see here the uh, formal definition. So this is an intersection of three images of the large disk. And uh, with this notion, this is a classical notion due to Duardi and Hubbard. And uh, with this notion, um, we can define what is a renormalization. Um, it's interesting that um, maybe we are now, th well, with Thursday, and uh, I don't remember exactly this definition the previous days. But the uh, map is called renormalizable if you can find a polynomial like restriction of this map uh, such that the field Julia set is connected. And it is non-renormalizable if uh, there are no such restrictions. However, it's not always possible to find a disk to which your critical point returns uh, in some multiples of uh, some integer iterate. And the question is, what do we do in this case? And another question you can ask, what do we do if there are many critical points and they do whatever they want, they interact, they accumulate at each other? Um, so the question, how to construct a more complicated induced dynamical system? And the answer to this question is to consider first return map to nice sets. 
And in this sentence, nice is not just an adjective, it's actually a definition. Uh, this is a definition due to Mark Martens, uh, which came from real dynamics. Uh, and it says the following. If we have a holomorphic map between U and V, uh, the set B is called nice. If uh, the iterates of the boundary of this set do not intersect the interior. And this is a very useful notion because it allows you to define a first return map. Uh, so you can define the following. So suppose you have this B, uh, as you can see here on the slide, um, or roughly disks, and suppose it is nice. So what, uh, what can we do? We can consider a point in, in B and uh, look for the first time the orbit of this point set uh, returns to this set B. Suppose such time exists and suppose it's three. Then uh, we have a um, third iterate that maps Z to uh, a point in, uh, inside our set B. And let's call this component V. Now we can pull back this component uh, V by the third iterate. And the question how the pullback um, uh, how does the pullback look like? Uh, here's a candidate. Here's a candidate. Um, but you can fairly quickly uh, convince yourself that this is not the case if the set is nice. Because I can find the point W inside this pullback such that it maps by the third iterate. Um, this W lies on the boundary of B and it maps into the interior of B which is impossible because we, B is nice. Therefore, this situation, um, as drawn here with this green uh, pullback, is impossible. And you can also convince yourself that this green pullback cannot enclose the whole component of B either. So the only possibility is that this pullback is contained inside uh, your set B. And uh, therefore, you, you can uh, nicely pull it back, update some component u, and then observe that all points in this u will have the same power of, um, of the map that uh, bring them back to b. In this way, we constructed what is called a branch of the first return map. And well, you can go on and consider other points. And the union of all such branches uh, constitute uh, the first return map. And this first return map can have many branches, uh, well, infinitely many. Uh, and in fact, some of the components of B can, uh, can map fully over other components of B. So it, has, uh, it can have a lot of structure. But this is a natural construction uh, because of many things. And uh, one of the things is, is written here. So if the orbit, the f orbit of a point intersect um, intersects B infinitely often. Uh, for example, if point Z is, is recurrent, so it returns back infinitely many times to smaller and smaller neighborhood of, uh, of itself, then the first return map will, uh, will be defined for infinitely many of the uh, iterates of, of Z. And therefore, in some sense, this first return map will capture the whole orbit. Uh, essentially captures the whole orbit. Of course, we will skip some of the iterates, but uh, most of the orbit will be captured. And therefore, if you want to understand uh, orbits of points, you can uh, just forget about some, some intermediate steps and uh, look only at these times where this orbit returns to a nice set. Um, in particular, uh, if, for instance, uh, the critical set of, of the map F uh, is in B, then um, you can easily see that the critical points of this first return map um, um, will, be, um, uh, will be a subset of this critical set of F. In this way, you can capture critical points. And as we know, you have to capture critical points because they determine uh, dynamic. And one technical thing, with some luck, we can arrange that these components uh, this green component that I drew, uh, they are compactly contained in uh, this uh, gray component. And uh, this is an essential thing uh, also for polynomial like maps. And uh, as you might remember from previous talks on renormalization, this annuli 
um, are of fundamental importance, and if we control them, we have some sort of compactness. But uh, I, can, I want to point out that here we, in some cases, we don't assume that we have compact containment. We, uh, have, we can have this picture uh, where components uh, of B map over some other components. And this picture brings us to a definition of what we call a complex box mapping. Here's a formal definition. Uh, so complex box mapping uh, is uh, a holomorphic map between two sets U and V, uh, such that uh, U contained in V, uh, F has finitely many critical points, uh, U, V is a uh, union of finitely many um, Jordan disks with disjoint closures, and every component, well, U of this curly U, the image is a component of V, and the map between those components is a proper map. And finally, um, each component of U is either uh, a compactly contained in, in a component of V, or they coincide. So what I just did, I just described you this picture. So this definition formalizes this picture, and therefore, this is a natural structure that you might expect if you consider first return map. Uh, this is a, one of the uh, aliases of, of this definition. There are other notions that are very similar or exactly, and people call such object generalized polynomial-like maps, uh, puzzle maps, R maps, etc. And um, my understanding that the origin of this concept is um, coming from, from real dynamics, and as we know, uh, complex methods are uh, beat some of the real methods in some cases, and therefore uh, this is a complexification of uh, what people were doing in real dynamics. Uh, but for purposes of this talk, I will call them box mappings. Uh, there are a couple of related notions that you can, uh, you can uh, observe for this, for this notion. So in some sense, this is uh, what, what I need to construct an induced map, and I can forget about everything else. And this defines me some, some neighborhoods of points, and I can again um, pull back this V uh, several times, and the component of uh, nth pullback of uh, this curly V is what we call a puzzle piece. Um, then I can define a non-escaping set, uh, the field Julia set of a box map in uh, K of V, and again, this is a set which I'm most interested in. This is where I can iterate my map infinitely often. And Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, so you don't assume that every component, is, so I mean, is it allowed that the component is periodic, so that a component maps to itself and never, you know um, what I mean, you're saying that the comp, you can have the situation where one component maps to another one. So is that far, something where if you pull back repeatedly, you have to end up inside, or are you allowed to have a component on which the map is, say, the identity? By this definition, I allow this. OK, thank you. Uh, but um, I will uh, disallow it in a couple of slides of this. Uh, but again, um, this is just a formalization of, a, of what we see on the picture. Um, and let me define another useful notion. Uh, and of course, this notion should have been defined earlier uh, in this conference. And this is a notion of a fiber. So a fiber is an intersection of puzzle pieces of depth n containing given point. So this is some, uh, some set. Uh, in most situations, it is a compact connected set, so it's some continuum. And it has, a, um, besides its formal definition, it has a, a nice um, dynamical meaning. So we call the fiber is trivial if it consists of a point x itself. Uh, and uh, the fiber of x is the is a set of points of X that travels through the components of our box mapping uh, with the same itinerary. And um, if the fiber is trivial, then the, um, well, the, the only point that travels is, is X. And that means that if all fibers are trivial, we can at some point distinguish points by their symbolic dynamics. And therefore, triviality of fibers is another way of saying that we can distinguish points combinatorially. And 
uh, in application, this is another way of saying that some set is, is some connected set is locally connected at this point X. Uh, but again, this is um, a stronger thing than, than just being locally connected. And here's an example. Uh, so this is an example of a box mapping. Uh, and in fact, uh, that goes all the way back to the work of uh, Brunner and uh, Hubbard. Uh, and this is an example of cubic polynomial. Uh, here's an explicit formula where one critical point is escaping, another critical point is uh, periodic. So critical point one escape. And this big yellow bulb is uh, the, the disk that you bound by, by picking some equipotential. And then if I pull it back once, I will get these two uh, orange disks, U1 and U2. And if I take the union, then the restriction of my map to U1, union U2, uh, will be a perfectly legitimate box mapping. And you can see here um, puzzle pieces. So all different shades of orange. Uh, they describe your puzzle pieces because these are pullbacks of V of various generations. And this uh, black part is actually fiber. For instance, here, the fiber of point minus one. Um, so uh, this is an example um, which you immediately can construct uh, for, um, uh, for such uh, escaping dynamics. And as we'll see uh, later, it's not always the case to construct this easily. Okay, and um, uh, now I will try to answer Lasse's question. Uh, in fact, this definition that I gave uh, is in some sense stupid, uh, or you can say it's too general um, because of the following. So we can hook up some examples of box mappings that we do not expect if we extract those box mappings from uh, a nice uh, globally defined dynamical system. And this, uh, proposition has um, four examples. One example is uh, the situation when the Julia set is the whole, uh, the field Julia set is, is V, and this is a stupid example. You take uh, U1 and V1 is a disk, and your map F is just an identity. You can do uh, what Lasse was suggesting, you can take several components that cyclically cir permutes it uh, by the map, and that will have the same effect. Of course, this is not something that we are interested in. Um, another example we can cook up is a uh, box map in F2 that have, um, so that uh, the field Julia set has full back measure in, in the domain of the map, uh, empty interior, and uh, there exists a positive uh, Lebesgue measure set that do not accumulate at any of the critical points. And again, um, you can think uh, why it is impossible, for instance, if you take uh, polynomials, usually if, if you don't accumulate at the critical set, then uh, the set of points is some sort of a hyperbolic set, and usual and, and more or less standard Lebesgue density argument tells you that that should be a uh, set of uh, zero measure, but this is not the case here. Um, also, we can construct a wandering disk for, for box mapping, and again, uh, this is something that um, you can do essentially because you allow for infinitely many components in the domain of your map. So you can construct some sort of a sequence of domains and you won't have uh, the shrinking of domains because, well, uh, your uh, Schwartz lemma doesn't work um, because of the uh, infinite number of components. And finally, there is a refinement of the second example. Uh, we can, in fact, construct um, um, a box map in such that uh, uh, the set of points that in the non-escaping set uh, whose orbit converge into the boundary uh, has full measure in our domain of definition. And why you would not expect it in general? Because if you think of the boundary of your puzzle pieces, of your box mapping, um, in the situation of polynomials, they usually uh, construct and use in rays and repelling periodic points for their pre-images. Therefore, this, this boundary is repelling, and uh, it is unlikely that the, the full measure set uh, converges to the boundary 
which is a repellent. But you can do that in this generality. And therefore, uh, looking at these pathologies, we said, okay, this is not something that you would expect if you extract from a big dynamic, uh, the globally defined dynamical system. And we define a notion of dynamically natural box. Essentially, a box mapping for which you don't have such pathologies. And uh, it has three properties. One says that uh, the stupid example number one is ruled out. So every component of you should have an escaping point. Uh, then the, Lebesgue, the second property is that Lebesgue measure of points that do not accumulate at the critical set uh, is zero. So as, as you would expect. And um, the non-escaping set consists of points that from time to time uh, go well inside uh, the domain of the definition of your map uh, in, in, well, in, in the domain. Um, so here's the formal definition. So meaning it, uh, this, this well inside means that for, for a given point, its orbit from time to time goes into some component of, uh, of your map such that the, uh, the uh, space between this component and the component, corresponding component of V is some space. Um, of course, this is a super weak notion since so this delta depends on the point. Um, and in case your U, this curly U, consists of only finitely many components, you basically have none of this problem. Uh, but we should allow for infinitely many components, and therefore we have to be more careful. And, uh, yeah. Um, well, as I said, so the question was, uh, this is a dynamical condition, and is there easy ways to check whether uh, your, your box mapping is dynamically natural. Um, if you can uh, ensure that the, the box mapping that you construct has finitely many components for you, then, then you are fine, then you are automatically dynamically natural. And in many situations, you can deduce this, these properties uh, by, uh, by knowing a little bit more of your dynamical and then dynamical. For instance, if you, if you construct your puzzle pieces, the boundaries of, of this, uh, of V using rays, you can, you can prove it, well, for instance, for polynomials. Um, so you have to check. It. Um, but again, we know more about dynamical system from which we extract box. Okay, and now, um, for purposes of this talk, uh, I decided to introduce uh, this notion of box, box renormalization. And this is precisely the situation when you can extract such a box mapping from your big dynamical system. And well, formally a map F is a bo box renormalizable if there exists a nice union V of topological disks um, so that the first return map to V as a structure of dynamically natural box mapping. and uh, we don't create additional critical points. So the critical set uh, for our box mapping that we construct is contained in this uh, critical set of our starting uh, map. Um, having applications in mind, of course, we're interested in, the, uh, in, in capturing critical orbits, and therefore we will build uh, these box mappings around critical points, and hence, uh, uh, you have to say something about them. Um, let me point out that this box renormalization uh, has nothing to do with honest renormalization. So box uh, renormalizable map may or may not be um, renormalizable in the uh, classical Doherty Hubbard sense. But again, this is a, a way how you can uh, work with more complicated um, critical dynamics. Um, you can be infinitely box renormalizable if you can keep extracting box mappings. And this is actually easy to do. For example, if you have a, a box mapping and a recurrent critical point, then you can easily see that this is uh, infinitely box renormalizable because what you do 
suppose this is your box mapping, you can see on the slide, um, as three components in, in U and two components in V, and two critical points, and you can see the arrows how the mapping behaves. Um, so this is your starting box map. How to renormalize it? Well, you, um, you can work with this partition. So you can first uh, pick uh, components of U containing your critical points. And this union is a nice set with respect to your starting box mapping. And then you take a first return map to this union. And again, first return map will have some structure. It can have same or different combinatorics from the starting one. Uh, but uh, you can check that uh, it is a box mapping. And if you start with the dynamically natural box mapping, so this list of three conditions is satisfied, uh, then uh, the uh, first return map to this union will also be dynamic. I am surprised at your inclusion of critical sets. The critical points of an iterate are the inverse images of the original critical point, including the critical point itself. Yeah. And so I would have expected the opposite inclusion. Um, uh, true, but this is ex exactly the way, in, in general, if you're not careful, you'll get what you're saying. So if you take some sets and you consider a first return map to this set, then um, the orbits of points can pass through critical points and create some additional critical points which are not. But in application, what you usually do, you, you have your map F, you have critical set, and you take nice neighborhoods of this critical set. And if you take a first return to this nice neighborhood, then you won't pass through other critical points. And therefore, uh, you, you get inclusion as, as it is on the slide. So this is the way how you, um, uh, how you want to construct them. So you, um, uh, you, won't, you won't get uh, additional critical points if in your set you already enclose all the critical points available. OK. Um, OK, and, and that's a new box mapping. And you can continue this process. Since your critical points recurrent, they return back uh, to uh, this uh, these neighborhoods. Um, so you can uh, continue extracting box map. Um, however, it is not clear if you start with some globally defined uh, map F, say some rational map, whether it's box normalizable or not. Uh, precisely um, because of what um, John was asking, if, you, if you're not careful, then you will create a lot of critical points. So it's not a problem to find a nice set. It's a problem to find a nice set that sort of controls uh, your critical orbit. Um, and intermediate takeaway of, of this talk uh, is that uh, if your uh, rational map, say, uh, is box normalizable uh, and this renormalization is not trivial, for instance, um, the we, we were able to capture all recurrent critical points of our starting map. Uh, and again, we, we are mostly interested in, in the situation of the critical points in the Julia set, then we're in business. So we're actually in a very good shape and we can deduce a lot of results from this box that I will uh, present momentarily. Uh, and this is a takeaway. Um, so this is precisely, uh, we're in the middle of my slides. Um, and this is what I would try to, uh, I'm trying to convey. Uh, because uh, in this abstract situation of box mappings, we have a box uh, full of results uh, on their rigidity. And um, first of this result is a theorem um, due to uh, Dirk and, and myself, which, uh, which is an um, upgrade, uh, fairly easy upgrade on a very non-trivial result due to Kozlovsky and Van Stream, which says the following. So if you have a dynamically natural box mapping and you pick a point in the non-escaping set, point Z, then we have two situations, we actually have two um, cases uh, for the orbit. So either Z has trivial fiber, 
which means that you can distinguish its symbolic dynamics among all symbolic dynamics with respect to this puzzle of uh, this box mapping from all other points. So we sort of know um, the trajectory, the orbit of this point. Or this that belongs to or is mapped after finitely many steps to some uh, field Julia set of free normalizable dynamics. So um, uh, which means that you either completely understand what's going on with your, with your orbit, or all the problems are happening in the polynomial side. Um, so with that respect, and if you know, for instance, that this polynomial, um, uh, if you know something more about this um, embedded polynomial, uh, then you can um, deduce some other problem. But this is a reduction uh, to just the polynomial uh, dynamic. And as I said, this is a, a fairly uh, easy generalization of the result due to uh, Alec and Sebastian, uh, which proved the, um, uh, and their proof actually uses uh, two powerful tools. One is a combinatorial tool, uh, and this so-called enhanced nest construction due to uh, Kozlovsky, Shen, and Van Strien, and another is an analytic tool, um, and this is a covering lemma due to Jeremy Kahn and Misha Lubitsch. Uh, to which Dima was alluding yesterday, was um, mentioning yesterday. Um, okay, and uh, for in particular, uh, if um, if we are non-normalizable um, box, uh, if if our box mapping is non-normalizable, then you can conclude that all fibers are trivial. Uh, this is a trivial uh, corollary. Uh, another result in our toolbox is um, this result about line fields. Let me remind you that uh, we say that F uh, box mapping carry, carries an invariant line field in its field on its field Julia set. If I can assign measurably at each point of the field Julia set a line such that uh, uh, if I uh, if point Z maps to point F of Z, then the line through Z maps to uh, the line through F of that, um, and uh, this measurable assignment, um, this invariant line field is is a space of quasi-conformal deformation that you can perform for your for your map, and if this uh, if this line field exists, and again. Uh, kind of sufficient condition is to, to have positive measure of a non-escaping set. And if, if this is satisfied, then, um, and it, if this exists, that, that allows you to deform your map quasi conformally using these um, fields, sort of extending them to ellipses and performing um, and constructing quasi conformal maps. Therefore, if we want a rigid map that we want to exclude invariant line fields, and what we were able to, to show in this uh, generality um, uh, with uh, Trevor, uh, uh, Alec, and Sebastian is that if we have a non normalizable dynamically natural box mapping, so we are not in the case where we have embedded uh, polynomial like map, um, and if F carries an invariant line field, then it should be very, very particular. Um, in, so it should satisfy these two properties. There should be a, um, a puzzle piece J and some, a smooth foliation on this puzzle piece with the property that this foliation actually, um, uh, well, with the property that the field Julia set fills this puzzle piece uh, and this foliation is tangent to the invariant line field almost everywhere. And um, if we start iterating this, uh, uh, this puzzle piece forward, um, uh, then uh, this, this forward orbit of this puzzle piece should intersect the critical set, and uh, the critical points at which it intersects must be strictly pre-periodic. Um, in particular, if for some reasons you know that your puzzle pieces, each of the puzzle pieces contain uh, an open set of escaping points, Think of, of rays uh, and pieces, uh, some open sets in the Fatou set, uh, then there are no invariant lines. 
because this condition cannot be satisfied. Uh, this condition cannot be satisfied. Um, however, uh, such strange objects do exist, um, and you can uh, cook up um, what we call lattes, box mappings, and um, you can prove that the existence uh, in, in general using uh, some result of Chetitsky and uh, Riviera Letiel. Um, and I just want to flesh this picture of, uh, of hand, uh, handmade example. Um, but again, um, these are very particular cases which you can sort of study directly. Okay, and um, the final tool in our toolbox is uh, you see rigidity. Um, and this is what usually referred to as rigidity. Um, and as uh, Mitsu pointed in the first lecture on renormalization, rigidity is when you start with some, um, um, some low regularity conjugation or some combinatorial equivalence, and you can promote it to some high regularity because it can form all conjugation or fine conjugation. And what we were able to show um, is that, well, in fact, this is um, uh, not, this, not, not fully we so that, uh, there was a version, uh, and the first proof was in, in the paper of uh, Alec and Sebastian. Um, and this result says that if you have a pair of non renormalizable dynamically natural box mappings, um, and assume that you have some QC homeomorphism that maps U to V, a U to U tilde and V to V tilde, um, and it, it is a conjugation on the boundary, so this condition two, and assume that um, your two maps are combinatorially equivalent with respect to this map in H, um, then you can conclude that your maps are quasi conformally conjugate. Uh, and this conjugation um, is, uh, agrees with H on, on uh, annulae, uh, of certain annulae. So it's sort of an extension. And uh, this combinatorial equivalence, uh, to define it precisely, takes some uh, several lines, but uh, you can think about it as follows. So here's in the picture, you have two box mappings, and uh, you can see two uh, generation of puzzle, puzzles. So this is a starting one, this is a first generation, there is a darker gray uh, puzzle pieces. So you can um, encode this, uh, the combinatorics using some curves uh, that connects boundary components. And uh, this, uh, this data is what you can define for a starting map F. And if H transfers this data, homotopy data from uh, F to F tilde, then we call them combinatorially equivalent. So sort of the pre-images uh, of puzzles are is the same structure and the same um, type of uh, same hom homotopy information. Um, and this is, this is the definition. So provided your maps are combinatorial equivalent, you can prove QC uh, conjugation. And again, this is, uh, this is a non-trivial result, um, which uses some, uh, again, this enhanced nest construction, covering lemma, and uh, another QC tool, which is, uh, you see criterion. Um, so I won't go into the proof. Um, what I want to uh, show you is how to, how to apply. Uh, and this is actually a strategy. And um, uh, this strategy consists of three steps. Uh, the first step is to uh, prove or establish that F, your starting dynamical system, small f, is box renormalizable in some non-trivial way. Um, so that if, if for some reasons or using some construction, you can ensure that uh, your, um, your re box renormalization, capital F, captures the most interesting part of the um, dynamics of F, uh, the most interesting part of the critical dynamics, um, then your, your step one is done. In many examples, this F, as I said earlier, is constructed as a first return map to some neighborhood of a critical set that intersect the Julia set of your map. And suppose this is done. Well, then you can perform two and three. And this is indeed now fairly easy. So you don't have to redo all these technical proofs and technical construction using some combinatorial analytic tools. Um, 
so what do you have to do? You, you have to check that f is dynamically natural, and in most cases, it's not difficult to do. And um, well, if you if you are dynamically natural, then you can essentially uh, take the results from the box and embed them back into the dynamic uh, in, into the dynamics of f. And this is just step three. So with these two steps, it's, these two steps are uh, more or less routine. Uh, step number one is less routine. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is now more like an art than um, routine, unfortunately, for step one. But again, let me emphasize, uh, if you are done with step one, then two and three um, are straightforward. And uh, at this slide, I actually collected uh, a list of results where you can uh, see or you can redo the proofs using this simplified approach. Um, first type of results, these are rational maps for which there is a total invariant uh, for two components, uh, which is infinitely connected. Um, and for these guys, you can construct puzzle uh, uh, box mappings uh, precisely as in this yellow example. Uh, and you can uh, prove several results. For instance, um, uh, if we and Ian proved uh, the Brunner Hubbard conjecture, uh, you can prove absence of invariant line fields, uh, ergodicity properties, you, you can uh, establish some ergodicity properties. So, this is one type of map. Um, another one is, of course, where it's, it started, so non normalizable polynomials. So, you can um, this is probably so far the strongest result that we have for rigidity in polynomial dynamics. So you can prove quasi-conformal rigidity, absence invariant line fields, and triality of fibers. And that was done by uh, Alex and Sebastian. And for that you use uh, you cause puzzles. And here's a slide with um, this construction. So you cause puzzles are built using rays, and you can see your uh, three periodic rays landing at alpha fixed point. Uh, they are cropped by some equipotential. So this is the starting partition, and then you can pull it back using the forward invariance of rays. So you get finer and finer partition. You can check that the boundary, so if you take a union of these pieces, then they will be nice in the definition that I gave. And therefore, if you're careful enough and if you uh, select properly these puzzle pieces, you can take a first return map uh, to some properly uh, chosen union of you cause puzzle pieces. That gives you a complex box mapping. Uh, and this is step one. And now you uh, conclude the result about uh, complex polynomials using uh, step two and three. Uh, you can also do, uh, you can reprove the result of Roche and Yin, uh, who show that the boundaries uh, of the two components of polynomials um, except Ziegel disk. Uh, are locally connected. And for that, you uh, again, the first step is non trivial. You have to construct puzzles. And uh, uh, how do they do that? They take, uh, you have this for two component, you can take internal rays and take external rays, uh, periodic, and you can crop them with equipotential from outside or from inside. And that will be your legitimate puzzle. But now um, you can again take properly uh, chosen set of puzzle pieces, consider first return, uh, and using the black box just to deduce the local connectivity. So with that respect, it's, um, it becomes like, like a procedure rather than an art. Uh, you can also redo uh, the proof for uh, local connectivity of the boundary of um, infinity for um, the family of McMullen maps. So this is the family of this form, and this is the result due to um, we one and yin um, with, uh, with the same procedure. Of course, in this situation, this is already a rational map, and it's not clear how to construct puzzles. So they use heavily the symmetry of, of, um, of these maps. So they're working in the Sierpinski, case, Sierpinski carpet case. They use some symmetry. Um, and the boundaries of their puzzle pieces, in fact, intersect the Joule asset in infinitely many points, in uncountably many points. But once you do that, once you control this combinatorics, uh, you can again do steps two and three 
without redoing all the machinery. And um, the case where it actually all started, this, this um, box mapping approach, is our work with Dirk and others on Newton maps of polynomials. And uh, so far, this is the largest uh, family of rational maps for which we know rigidity, um, for, for, for which we know rigidity. And uh, in the last 10 minutes, or maybe seven minutes, um, let me show you how, how we did that. Um, and again, uh, now we are talking about step one. So here's a brief recap of what is the Newton map. So this is a map that wants to be iterated. Uh, if it comes with the classical Newton root finding method, um, when you take uh, tangent lines and then you iterate, and in a complex world, it kneels down to this formula. If P is a polynomial, then the Newton map of this polynomial is this rational map. It has a very particular structure. Uh, so all the fixed points, um, one of, of them is infinity, which is a repellent fixed point, and all the other fixed points are roots, as they're supposed to be. And uh, we know that the Julia set is connected and the um, uh, basins of roots um, are uh, simply connected. And here's a picture that I uh, took from the paper of uh, uh, John, uh, Dirk, and Scott. So this is a dynamical plane of degree 7 Newton map. And uh, uh, if, you can see the, if you see this picture for the first time, um, uh, then you, you should observe uh, that uh, there is a particular structure at infinity. So all these big components of, of colored components, these are points that converge into corresponding roots. And each of the immediate basins of roots, for instance, this green one, uh, has several accesses to infinity in a very regular way, as you can see it on the Riemann sphere. So it has three accesses, one from the back and two from the front. And this particular structure of boundaries of um, root basins allows us to control combinatorics. Um, uh, again, you, you start with, with these immediate basins. You uh, take a fixed trace within these basins and you crop them with equal potentials. You take the union of all these uh, fixed traces, uh, fixed rays. You can think of these fixed rays as some curves going in the direction of infinity in each of these um, root um, immediate basins. And this is what we call uh, a channel diagram, delta. So this is a, a forward invariant set. Um, in fact, it's just a fixed uh, uh, set. So what I can do, I can uh, start pulling them back. So they serve the purpose of rays, so I can start pulling them back. But the problem is if I pull them back uh, too severely, they might disconnect. Because there are poles, and um, since all the basins are connected to infinity, then the preimage of infinity, which is a pole, should contain some preimages of this rays. And um, unfortunately, we are ending with the situation when, when the complement of this pullback uh, is not a simply connected domain, so it's not a disk. And uh, we like working with disk. Uh, therefore, we have to do something with that. And um, there were several results which um, showed that essentially if you pull back long enough, you can capture all these uh, runaway poles. Um, and uh, once you capture a runaway pole, uh, all of them, then the next pullback will be connected. Uh, therefore, the complement will be, uh, complement components will be simply connected. And that allows you to define uh, Newton puzzle pieces. Um, I'm skipping um, um, a, lo a lot of details here, but this is a picture that you can, uh, you can see in the Newton plane. So uh, this is the boundaries of these puzzle pieces. Again, so these parts are primages of fixed rays, and well, this is a renormalizable bit. Um, let me skip this. Um, Again, this is a starting partition for some example of, of a Newton map uh, with puzzle pieces. So the, and you can pull back this construction. And in fact, there is a, there is a step um, which, which is non-trivial to show. 
uh, we have to show that our Newton maps are box renormalizable so that we can extract box, box mapping. And this is done via so called triality of fibers at infinity. Let me maybe skip this part. But if we are box renormalizable, we are, as I said, in business and we can include the result. Just following steps two and three, we can prove the following theorem. Um, so for any Newton map of a uh, polynomial of any degree d, um, for eight, each point in the, in the uh, Riemann sphere, we have three alternatives. Um, the first alternative is uh, Newton specific. So your point might converge to a root, which some of them should do, since it is a root finder. Uh, but the other two alternatives um, you've already seen. So this is exactly the, the cases that we've uh, observed in uh, the general result about box mappings. So either Z has a trivial fiber or it, it is associated um, to a renormalizable dynamic. There was a related work, uh, of course, on this uh, question for cubic Newton maps. Uh, Pascal uh, originally proved a lot of results uh, in her famous paper. And uh, there was an independent work by uh, one Yin and Zhen to prove local connectivity of the boundaries of uh, basins of roots. Um, and uh, we have several results in our tool toolbox, therefore we can apply all of them. And another one is um, about rigidity of Newton maps. Uh, and this is a result that you can... Um, I mean, first, of course, we have to define what, is, what are combinatorial equivalent Newton maps. And we can simply say uh, that suitably normalized Newt uh, Newton maps are combinatorial equivalents if they are pullbacks of these channel diagrams, which we called um, Newton graphs. Uh, they are combinatorially the same. And uh, the uh, rigidity, uh, parameter rigidity, as we call it, uh, which uh, Dirk and I established, uh, says that uh, if we start with a pair of combinatorial equivalent Newton maps, um, so they, then they are quasi conformally conjugate in some neighborhood of the Julia set, provided they are either non normalizable so we eliminate this case, or we, can, we should account for this renormalization bits and we say that they are renormalizable in the same way. Um, and again, up to some uh, normalization, uh, we can. Um, we can even show using the result of online fields that Newton maps are a fine conjugate in this case. There was a parallel work of um, uh, Roshin and Zhen uh, who uh, proved parameter rigidity for non-normalizable Newton maps using, um, uh, without using box map. Okay, and um, I'm coming to my last two slides. Uh, this is a, a second takeaway, uh, and this is uh, some bit of philosophy, depending on your attitude to philosophy, which says um, we, can, we have two types of rigidity. One which is uh, less commonly called rigidity is dynamical rigidity, and a map is rigid if we can distinguish the orbits of any two points in some combinatorial terms. And there's a more classical rigidity or parameter rigidity uh, for a family of holomorphic maps, and uh, they are rigid if, if we take two pairs of maps, uh, which are if for any pair of combinatorial equivalent maps, they are quasi conformally conjugate. And the bit of philosophy, which uh, um, uh, is called uh, rational rigidity principle, is, as we call it, says that um, a rational map is either rigid or contains an embedded polynomial dynamics. And parameter rigidity says that, well, family is either rigid or it contains non-rigid um, pieces of polynomial, uh, polynomial dynamics. So this is a, a philosophy, which in the Newton case is a theorem, uh, but we believe that this is more than a philosophy and it can be, um, we believe that it is true in many cases for rational maps of uh, many degrees and in many families. And especially it relates to uh, the current decomposition theory that uh, Misha will be talking tomorrow, uh, which says that essentially you can decompose any rational map 
well, in their case, it was critically finite, but we believe that this is, it can be lifted into pieces, which one of them, uh, that you, what used to call uh, Newton-like map, uh, Newton maps, which people call crochet maps, and for these guys, this type of result should be established. Okay, and let me finish with the challenge. And the challenge says that we should develop a general uh, renormalization theory for box maps. So this is a very um, useful object, uh, and it helps to tackle many questions about multi-critical maps, and uh, it would be great if we understand how this renormalization uh, behaves in the long term. And there are some starting work uh, more in the real world. Uh, Daniel Smania, for instance, had some work uh, where he was working with some sort of this object, but um, it feels that we can do more. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Any questions? Um, I, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, to, to talk about the more general rational maps, um, let's imagine um, quadratic rational maps. So, I, well, I'm, I'm not really an expert in rational dynamics, so I might be saying things that don't make sense, but uh, a priori, I, I might imagine uh, that there could be a situation um, where we have uh, one of those wandering continua that we get for infinitely renormalizable quadratic polynomials. So, you know, a continuum which contains no, no, uh, uh, no periodic points and is wandering in the Julia set. And if you imagine such a continuum containing both critical values of your quadratic rational map, then I guess that would be an abstraction to building a box mapping, right? Because in the pre image you would have something which would separate the plane. And which you couldn't easily cut up somehow using um, using hairs or or or, or, or race or, or anything like that. Um, so, um, do you think that such things don't exist? Or is, there, is there an obvious reason why they couldn't exist? And do you think they don't exist? Um, I don't know about any obvious reasons why the situation is impossible. So. Um, I mean, if you can cook up such an example, I would be very interested to see it. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I don't know. So far, the hope that um, you can um, separate all this continua that you were talking to, uh, to, to, to really make them part of some uh, building Julia set of polynomial inside. But if, if what you're saying is true, then we should think a little bit more what we say in this case. I mean, I have no idea whether we should think such a thing should exist or not. But uh, I think if, if it did exist, then that would cause a, might potentially cause an issue. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I'd like you to go back to slide 33. Okay, so I am trying to understand the meaning of dynamical rigidity, and particularly the, your claim that these Newton maps are dynamically rigid. In what sense can you distinguish via symbolic dynamics all the orbits of F, and in particular those which converge to roots? Um. <clears throat> Well, um, this is a slide about philosophy. So these points that converge to roots, they, they, we know what they do. So in some sense, uh, this is uh, uh, what we usually don't consider. So we're interested in orbits in the Julia set. Oh, so you, it's specifically when you're talking about dynamical rigidity, you're talking yeah. about orbits of points in the Julia set. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, in this, yeah, in this questions, we are not interested in the. Any other questions from online or live audience? Um, I had a, 
I was wondering what the what's the why do you allow infinitely many components? What's the motivation there? Um, well, because they just appear. Um, so if um, if you really want to consider the honest full, uh, first return map, then um, you have many possibilities of return, and therefore um, you have countably many components that that, that appear there. Um, in some situation, you can um, work with with uh, finitely many, uh, but that should be specified. For instance, if you work with critical points that are um, uh, so-called persistently recurrent, uh, then you, in some cases, you might work only with finitely many components. Uh, but uh, in in general, um, think for a situation when when your your critical orbit is dense in the Julia set. And if you take some some large disk uh, or some some union of disks that are nice, then the first return to this union we obviously have infinitely many components uh, because there will be points that um, um, that lie inside and they have to have to return to critical points. So they will generate more and more um, uh, pre images. So uh, unfortunately, we have to allow uh, allow for that. Uh, so, can I ask a question? In the case of uh, your quasi-conformal rigidity result, you see two uh, articles, actually. So, what's the difference between the two? Um, the difference is... Uh, where is the point? Yeah. Um, well, the difference... Um, there were some uh, non-essential cases that were um, not described. And we we describe them, um, and uh, uh, kind of in fact, uh, as many experts know, the most difficult case is is a persistent recurrent critical points, uh, which, as I said already, they generate a box mapping with finitely many components in in the domain, and this is what was what was essentially uh, ex explained in this paper. But uh, the situation which which is Assume, uh, presumably easier requires some technical assumptions as we as we uh, put them this dynamically natural so essentially the result is proved in kvs and uh, we provided some uh, clarification uh, in our work with trevor and uh well, in myself okay and uh, actually about so we're assuming that is not anomalizable in this case but if it's anomalizable can you say something i mean can you have like prove that the conjugacy is um, you uh, can quasi conformal. There's a pseudo conjugacy that's quasi conformal outside the small Julia sets or something like that. Exactly. Uh, so you can. Um, so let me just scroll to our, to our Newton um, Newton theorem. Um, so in the in the context of box mappings, you can prove the same. So. Um, if they are non-renormalizable and combinatorial equivalent, then you can say that they QC conjugate. But if they are renormalizable, uh, then, um, for instance, if you if you know rigidity for this renormalizable bits, or you assume that you have some some sort of QC conjugacy or hybrid conjugacy between these polynomials, then you can glue these renormalizable bits in your in your uh, complex box mapping and conclude. Um, uh, conclude uh, uh, a fine uh, conclude QC conjugacy. You can probably phrase it something like outside of this renormalizable parts you have um, QC conjugacy. So you can, okay. but but essentially, as I was um, repeating myself over and over, you should know more about polynomials, um, and we can essentially then embed everything that we know about polynomials into this. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.